Okay, so welcome to Incommensurate Mapping at CAMH, the Contemporary Art Museum Houston. I'm going to take you on a walkthrough of um, my show. So I'm really excited to have a video document of the show because I feel like the histories I brought out in the exhibition belong to the whole city, you know, not just the museum. And kind of on that note, here our Houston is a project that I started um, and it's public generated audio walking tours and it's an online platform where people can take a walk and record their thoughts, stories, memories, histories along the way. And then they upload it here and anyone can download it for free. Um, and it's ideal scenario, people would actually go and retrace the tour maker's steps and kind of layer their perspective onto the geography that we share. At the time, it was really a response to Houston being so sprawling and dominated by car culture and oftentimes isolating. And so this was a way digitally to kind of collapse the commons in a city that doesn't, doesn't have a lot of it. Um, but I'll talk a little more later about how it's evolved, but at the time that it started, it had pretty humble beginnings, so we'll come over this way. Um, I got the idea for here in Houston when I was walking from my apartment to the medical center a lot. My mom was being treated for terminal cancer, and the walk was like this moment um, before I arrived to have the world fall on my shoulders in this pause when I could breathe and I was also compulsively listening to audiobooks, like just one after the other to be in anybody else's story but the one I was in and at some point I just thought what if where I was walking had to do with what I was listening to and that's how Here Are Houston started. Um, but after she passed away I had gone from being her primary caregiver to being the primary caretaker of her house and the house that I'd grown up in and it was my family's house, no one else had ever lived in it and um, you know, sort of the available rituals when someone passes in my culture had come and went, the memorial service and the funeral, and they were spent, but I was still in grief. So I had to invent more to be able to move on. And so I started repul uh, just like compulsively returning to the house out in Katy. And this was like, Katy to me is a little different than what the connotation is now, because when I grew up it was a lot more like football fields and rice and you know the railroad and Southern Baptist and barbecue and it really had its own identity a little bit less of a copy and paste um, extension of the city but so I would make the drive out there and I was doing like the duties of a daughter kind of spiritually stewarding the house so that a new family could move in but also I guess because my form of being in the world as art, I was also doing performances and documenting them in video and inserting things back into the house and it was drawings and sculpture and videos and um, so what's in this little room is a walkthrough video from that and everything that happened during that time between when my mom passed and when the house was put on the market, I called it Care House and um, you know I I, and it was during a time also when there were so many foreclosures um, throughout the nation, so I decided to share it, and initially I just invited people that I knew, um, and they would get a, like a lock box key, and they'd drive out and go in the back door and walk through the house all by themselves. Um, but then eventually it spread, you know, not just art people and people I knew, but to medical professionals and hospice workers and people who'd been through similar experiences. Um, so at that time, you know, that little suburb was emptying out. People were moving to neighborhoods even further away. The house ended up selling for very little. But since that time, the house that Care House was in has been flipped twice for profit by investors. And it's, to me, just mapping this arc of Houston going into the boom that we're currently in. So speaking about that, these kinds of signs here, these uh, sort of triangle real estate signs, they're pretty ubiquitous all over the city. You know, as a placeholder, it's always what's there between what was there and what will be there, especially as so much in the city is being rebuilt. Um, 
and we just took this sign from Montrose and Marshall. Um, but the project that's displayed on it is from 2009, and it was the first time I'd seen one of these mixed-use developments in Houston, and I thought I was just so startled that someone could kind of put this master-planned private micro-city on top of a portion of the city, and they had used, um, they had covered up the construction and the public sidewalk with this block-long fence that had advertisements of who they wanted to live there, so it was like silhouettes of their ideal, you know, occupants, and it was really specific, like people that sit in modern furniture and read newspapers, and people that have really big boobs and walk really little dogs, and you know, people that shop and drink cocktails, and I just, um, I just decided to insert my own eight foot tall silhouettes that matched of the people that were actually there building it for them, but in the end being shut out. So I inserted these construction worker silhouettes sort of in the, in the negative space of what they intended, and they stayed up for three days until they noticed and definitely got rid of them <laughs> right away. And that project is called Who Belongs. So, and then, so I was speaking kind of about how Houston has changed so much from when I moved back from school to now. And there's a lot to say about a practice that's based on a city that's changing so much. And one thing is, you know, how do I steward these stories that were originally captured as a way to celebrate the underappreciated in a city that's now over-touted? And some, in some ways, the most important things about our city are kind of overexposed. So for the past few years, I've been working more with students at HCC in public schools and then also neighborhood groups. And that's kind of how I learned how to dig through archives, um, look back at histories, which is something I used a lot in this show. That one example is this project called The Human Tour. And uh, it was done originally in um, 1987 by Michael Galbraith. And he had used cutting edge computer technology to plot this human form onto a map of Houston. And it resulted in this 40 mile driving route. And these maps were available at public libraries and at Diverse Works where he had the whole exhibition. And people could go and discover whatever this kind of arbitrary route um, had for them. And so 26 years later, I, was, I had this just hanging and I would, think about this little guy in the white onesie and wonder like what the route would be like now. And so my collaborator Alex too and I, we, um, that's Alex and that's my little suit. We programmed 10 public walks at like all different times of day and um, days of the week and invited people to come with us and we were just this pretty scrappy, you know, caravan. It was really fun. We decided you know, to make it a walking tour instead of a driving tour um, for some of the reasons I also started here at Houston. But we wore the suits not just you know, in homage to Galbraith's project, but also we were thinking of them as like, we wanted to be blank canvases that the city would leave its mark on. And it, I mean, you know, it did. It definitely soaked up a lot of these Houston juices that are still in there today, especially on Alex's. <laughs> We're aiming for somewhere between like NASA engineering and like a Halloween costume your mom would make. <laughs> and so this project is actually really recent and I wanted to collapse two different areas and even eras of town. So, you know, Houston, it's so amnesiac, but the booms and the busts that it goes through are very cyclical, and there's always some form of like architectural artifact left over, whether it's the suburban cul-de-sac or the shopping mall or, you know, the office high rise or the strip mall, and then now these townhouses, um, you know, they spring up at peak value and then they empty out, and then if history repeats itself again, I think, you know, like these townhouses will go the way of the strip mall where they become reoccupied by this defiant, creative restructuring and reuse of what was intended. So um, I just kind of wanted to collapse that because I think there is a lot of fear of how the city is changing. And I, I think it's an optimistic note to say, we'll come back around, you know, it'll be ours again when 
we get to fill back in the leftovers. And so I think I'm always really focused on this pivot point or the pause between the inhale and the exhale or that arc between the boom and the bust. And um, with access to the CAMS archives for months, which I would go in and go in and dig through everything, I also focused on those moments in the institution's history. So we're going to time travel a little because I picked moments in 1962, 1972, and 1982. And they're all really crucial moments um, that, I, that I picked out. It's not necessarily the things that the CAM right now is representing as their history, but it's the things that really resonated with me you know, as an artist in the city. So these are all board minutes um, from 1959 to 1962. And Donald Barthelme, who's really well known as an influential postmodern American author, was actually the director of the CAM for nine months. And so there's not a lot of trace of him. Like he wasn't a public figure, but it was possible to trace his signal through the static of like the backstage board minutes and just this huge amount of information, these kind of very tiny but important decisions that he made that changed the course of, I think, everything that happened hereafter. So um, the CAM started in 1948. And it was a contemporary art association. And it was a really like DIY kind of art club. They would get together, put on exhibitions. And, um, but in 1955, they hired their first professional director, Jermaine McKaggie, And she really whipped it into shape. It became a professional institution. She was you know, educated in how to run a museum. And, um, but by 1959, they had not renewed her directorship, citing economic reasons and everything was really falling apart. So this is the version of the board minutes that was typed, you know, as the meeting was happening. It's not the officially adopted version. And it's talking about how, um, it's talking about how the volunteers are disengaged and resigning. When McKagey, when McKagey was there, they felt like, you know, they'd been relegated to stamp lookers, even though this whole massive project was their baby. And so they were disengaged. Um, they called for ejecting and replacing all the members of the board, the executive steering committee did. And then also the board themselves were admitting that the shows were failing to make an educational contribution to the community, that they were boring. And they explicitly listed their options as um, folding into Rice or folding into the Museum of Fine Arts or just giving up altogether. And so it's in this that Bartholomew steps in. And at first, they're like, oh, you're a writer, so why don't you write copy for our brochures? And Bartholomew keeps putting in these you know, kind of high-minded dreams about the ideal museum of the future. And they keep saying, we can't have that. We don't even have the ability to keep a janitor right now. You know, we, um, are cons they were considering at the time hosting a show, a poster show by the Houston Cat Association just for the chance of winning $5,000. And so they, weren't, they didn't feel like they had room to imagine. Um, and what Bartholomew does with um, his good buddy, Herman Gerders, more on the financial side, is they submit this un completely unsolicited proposal. And it's basically saying that the CAM is going to have itinerant programs around the city. And they'll be, chaired, they'll be curated by volunteer chairmen. And they're not just going to be visual art. They're going to be film. They're going to be. Um, theater, they're going to be music, and so they're really diversifying what they're doing, and the city of Houston responds, and they actually um, start going to it. You know, Bartholomew has this TV show lined up for the cam. They're showing a lot of really important films that Houston's never seen before, and so <laughs> he's taking this moment, instead of like the whole thing collapsing, he's introducing a whole new way that the museum could be. So... Um, both when he applies to be director, he's doing most of this before he's director, he's just a board member. But both when he applies to be director and then when he's leaving, about to leave to go to New York, you know, where his career, his writing career takes off, he's saying that, you know, the museum is arriving at this crossroads 
The MFA at the time is showing more contemporary work and the CAA feels like their turf is really threatened. So Barthelme in this letter says, on the question of the future of the museum, I believe the board must make what amounts to a radical choice. If what is desired is a museum in the traditional sense, going about its business in traditional ways, then a name director is mandatory. And he also advocates for a new building. The alternative is an avant-garde museum. The CAA began as this sort of organization, bringing contemporary art to the city. And then now, as the museums expand, the larger museum, the Museum of Fine Arts is expanding, we'll only hope to supplement or footnote their efforts. An avant-garde museum, on the other hand, would enter areas the MFA is not likely to deal with, in a sense, cannot afford to deal with. These are the most exciting areas, those which the CAA is most, most nearly equipped to handle. We would gain a direction, a working philosophy, and a sphere of influence that would be both uniquely ours and needed in the community. So he's saying, you know, the museum can be a successful museum. You know what boxes you need to check for that, or you can pave an entirely new way. And right before he leaves, like his idea of this includes things like the TV show that I mentioned. He really wants to have this um, summer-long festival on 50 acres near attics with like marching bands and artists doing happenings and music. And he brings Elaine de Kooning to come kind of pilot this micro school hosted by the CAM where um, it's for profit and budding Houston artists can learn from you know this New York artist. And he wants to show Houston artists as well. And my favorite is that he proposes that they pay four artists from different disciplines to move to Houston to be paid to live here and make work for the CAA and to serve in a policy making role. And he was dead serious about this. And everyone actually is voting for it at the time. He's got a lot of support. Um, but he soon leaves to New York, you know. He has to go change the course of American fiction instead. So um, I think a lot of people know also that Barthelme, he came back to Houston eventually to help found the creative writing program at University of Houston. But before that, and before um, New York and writing for The New Yorker and all his published books, and before the CAM, he was editing the college news newsletter at U of H. And it was supposed to like, you know, report on faculty and student events. And instead of doing that, Bartholomew was soliciting writing from all the thinkers that he thought was in were interesting at the time and just ask writing to everyone and asking them, hey, put your stuff in my newsletter. And um, it turns out that that was the first time that Marshall McLuhan's The Medium is the Message was ever published in this kind of dinky college newsletter at U of H called Forum. And so I think that maneuver, as we skip ahead to 1972, is pretty familiar with the next director I'm going to talk about. So in 1972, Sebastian Lefty Adler is the director of the CAM, and his first shows that he ever did were in Wisconsin, and he would convince the Smithsonian to let him have touring shows, and then he would hang them up in public school gymnasiums. So he would go at 8 in the morning and hang up paintings and take them down by 4 in the afternoon so that <laughs> they wouldn't get hit by basketballs. And this is just the way that Lefty thought. You know, he was championing new and relevant work. He was not about culture on a corner. He thought art should be for everyone. He did not want the museum to be you know, an acropolis or a country club. He thought it should be a civic space and a thriving workshop that artists could use to create the new world. Um, and so it was with this outlook that he spearheads the construction of this building that we're standing in. And although it was stabilizing you know, as a permanent structure for the museum, everything about it was specifically designed to prohibit stasis. So at the time, the floors were all concrete, and so anything could happen here, and then it would just be swept down the drain. There was like a compressed air system in the floor. The whole ceiling grid is electrically outfitted, so you can plug in anything anywhere you want. It's still really functional. And the entire outside of the museum specifically had a reflective surface because they were obsessed with making it a 24-7 light sculpture. The whole museum would be art, and it would be available for people to see 24-7. And Gunnar Burkertz was the architect um, who worked on this here with Lefty. And it was just, really, it was just a really stripped down you know, workshop for artists. So in that line, you know, when this building opened in 1972, 
they had this show called Ten, and it was um, ten commissioned artists who did projects, and it included things like a giant Goodyear blimp on constant cyclical orbit out from the can. There was a garden growing inside of here with, um, you know, veggies that were supposed to be harvested and feasted upon throughout the course of the show. There was a 20-foot wave channel outside where um, the artists had collaborated with a meteorologist to produce this constant wave that would go through it. And then there was a wall height installation of caged animals, like representing a parasitic pyramid of human-animal relations. But that's what earned the show 10, the nickname Roach Show, because there were roaches in it. And there's an article here talking about um, the head of the board trying to procure roaches from all around Houston, having students from St. Thomas catch them for the purposes. Um, and although, you know, I think that if this show happened now, I'd still be extremely excited and inspired, it did not go over well <laughs> with all of Houston. And, you know, half the board was scandalized because, for one, a lot of the artist projects were so ambitious and they didn't work as well as they should have. So I think in that respect, you know, it wasn't all it could be. But also, the board was scandalized because they had spent so much time raising money for this building and then what was in it was disgusting to like half of Houston. And they fired Lefty less than a year later. But then the other half of the board resigned in protest because they felt like, you know, the museum was punishing the best thing that it had going and instead of pressing forward with this avant-garde vision, you know, like, that he'd really set up. They were kind of apologetically redirecting into like self-preservation mode while they were getting rid of the reason that they had to exist anyways, which is to bring, you know, what was pretty revolutionary at the time, the work of living artists to a non-collecting institution. Um, you know, so I think it's known now as the Roach Show, but more important than that to me is how it must have ignited Houston artists' imagination at the time, like, if you think of a stretch in what's possible, of what the art museum's going to deal with, it must have gone from, like, here to here. Or, you know, that's what they were thinking at the time. And I still find it inspiring even now. So it's an important thing I've learned through the archives, like the power of recuperating these failed endeavors now in their future to see if they have a second life. So one sort of unofficial, unsanctioned part of the show that I made is um, I had access to Glass Tire because I wrote for them a few years ago. And I was thinking of how to present this really inspiring material from Lefty in a way that would be engaging, you know, more than just the newspaper clippings on the wall. And so I crafted this interview compiled from direct quotes from Lefty in about 1972. and. Um, and put it together and called it an interview with the CAMS director. And I didn't say which director, um, but it did have a link within the text to the source quote so people could see immediately if they clicked on it that it wasn't the present director, it was, you know, from when this building began. Um, so yeah, I just think, you know, taking a second look at these ejected directors and exhibitions that were considered flops and even endeavors that no one bothered to document um, has just been really exciting because there's so much there. I think, you know, some, just because something didn't succeed entirely didn't, doesn't mean that it failed absolutely. And um, then we'll jump ahead again to 1982. This is a panel, again, in this space. Um, you'd have to wait a while to see it, but Don Barthelme's on there. And on this panel, it's 10 years after the museum's open, and the camps are really taking stock of their history. And um, Ann Holmes, who's an incredible journalist, uh, editor of the art section of the Chronicle for more than 40 years, is really asking the tough questions. And, and Barthelme's on it talking about this show called The Ugly Show, of which there's pretty much no documentation. We have recreated it in the elevator um, with audio spoken by a local writer. But the Ugly Show was in response to, like, you know, the CAA kept sh doing all this stuff where they were showing people, like, oh, this is the kind of furniture you should buy if you have good taste. And Don Barthelme was like, um, let's just show, like, he called it New American Artifacts, kind of the negative space of that. And so it was things like giant tubs of Vaseline and, like, poorly printed versions of The Last Supper and, you know, kind of, like, smutty knockoff ashtray sculptures and, um, 
So he was showing all that, and there was a pretty big uproar about the Christ, and there was also an American flag that was poorly printed. And so there's not, you know, no one really, the museum didn't even bother to document it. But I think it's one of the coolest shows that must have ever happened. I mean, just that, like, trickster turn and, and what the museum was, they were going to deal with what was around everyone all the time, not just, like, what was really special and inside this sacred space. So, um, meanwhile, that they're doing this panel in 1982, they have this show downstairs called Dreams and Schemes, and they invited architects to reimagine the cam. And so, these little models, you know, they're taking up space in the imagination, even though they were in miniature. Um, you know, a lot of them really rehearsed this collapse of art into real estate investment that we see around us today. This one is literally like a temple to refining and profit. There's this base parallelogram, which is the current building. And in that, they would have the present decade's um, collection of art, you know, contemporary art. And then the next decade, they would kind of refine it and it gets a smaller collection and the next decade smaller and smaller and more refined and then so elite so that once this rarefied collection at the top tier is so valuable and so many years removed, it would be sold to the Museum of Fine Arts in order to fund the next decade's influx of contemporary art. So they were thinking of, you know, economic structures as well as physical. And then this one is just for-profit condos um, stacked on top of the cam. They're saying that it would generate $733,000 a year. But the funny thing about it is it has this spiral driveway where you were intended to just drive up the side of the building <laughs> to your door. So I think, you know, like I said, they were taking up space, physical space in the world, but also they're a time capsule of the imagination, especially in contrast to just 70, in 72, only 10 years previous, like what they were thinking. Um, the museum should do or should be. And so this is just pieces from the catalog and correspondence of that. You know, I think we've really gotten used to thinking like, oh yeah, these forms of optimism or activism or resistance that could happen in the 60s and 70s aren't available to us anymore. Like, maybe that degree of progressiveness will always stay in the past. Um, you know, like reports on the generation of which I'm a part talk about how they're, we're not going to be as economically successful as our parents. There's less job availability, there's greater income equality, there's looming climate catastrophe. Um, precarity is like the default career mode and it seems like crisis is the ongoing state of things. So in a sliver between which the, top, the past is taught as having failed and the future seems to be foreclosed, what maneuvers do we possibly have? And the two that I've been trying out are like, what I mentioned, kind of recuperating tactics of resistance and revolution from the past and see if they can have a second life now in their future under different circumstances and like refusing to accept that nothing about them, you know, worked. Um, and then the other one is to support and give platform to those who still can imagine a future forward and so in this show, I also decided to redistribute the honorarium that the CAM gave me to students that I know from my day job. And so, um, you know, their assignment was to make spaces for creativity, to invent their own space. I didn't even call it a museum, just the infrastructure for what they needed for their own creative practice. And so this is um, high schooler Lauren Fisher. And she collected water from different areas around town that meant a lot to her. And she made this suitcase display where she wants to have the work that she makes like on her body at all times. And she wants to have control over who it's visible to. Um, and I thought that was a pretty interesting gesture about privacy for a generation that, you know, kind of hasn't grown up with much of any. And this is Alex Rodriguez, um, and she focused on the space, not when an artist is displaying what they've made, the final product, but what they need before that, and it's, it's sharing ideas and sharing inspiration and having time to journal and having time to germinate ideas and to be nourished, you know, as someone who's creative and expected to make a creative output. So I 
I chose Alex and Lauren because they totally rejected the premise of my assignment altogether. <laughs> I was really excited with what they came up with. And then this is um, Irma Cifantes and Sylvia Izaguirre, and they are graduate students at University of Houston School of Architecture. And I talked to a lot of architecture students, and they really freaked me out because you know, even in projects where they had creative control, they were really self-imposing this kind of paranoia about, I have to make it a bargain, I have to make it cheaper, so I'll win the bid, so the client will choose mine. And I would ask them, like, what's the most out-of-the-box great idea you've had? And they'd say things like, well, if I use this material, it saves money on shipping. And I was just like, so glad to meet Sylvia, who had these conceptual ideas beyond that kind of restricted framework of what it would mean to build successful architecture. And Sylvia and Irma, their first time coming to the CAM was for this project. And so what they really focused on is making a CAM with more lateral access. So their whole idea was that maybe you would go underneath this clouded hover CAM in order to get shade, in order, you know, on your way from the larger institution, the MFA across the street. And they were thinking about how to make it a more open open space for the whole city. And then this is third grader Daniel Garcia's. And we started out working with a parallelogram shaped, you know, a foam board model because Gunnar Burkert's he had called the parallelogram a racked square. He said that he'd taken a square and he'd racked it to fit the footprint of land they had to work with. And Daniel immediately wanted it sliced and put back into a regular square. And then he wanted it to be a fishing house. And then he wanted it to float on the clouds. And then he invented all these games that you could play. And you could catch fish. And you could catch the stars. And um, inside, there's a janitor that sweeps by throwing a giant spear broom at things. And he just really <laughs> completely knocked it out of the park. And so all these pedestals, um, the pedestals that the models are on are all on loan from people and institutions that are my personal support network um, that have enabled the creation of the work by, you know, sticking with me throughout, throughout my time in my practice. And I thought it was just really important to avow that support and, you know, show a little bit, bring physical representation of what it takes um, to create the work. And then the, these periscopes, um, if you look at the models through them, it gives kind of an immediate feeling of being re-embodied in a different space. You can feel like you're walking around inside of these, um, these propositions that people have made. And I was hoping also to create like this, these multiple strata so that there's multiple points of entry and multiple levels for people to encounter the work on. sand tray is, um, this is a cross between like a playground sandbox and a Jungian sand tray. And they're used in play therapy. The client can choose from a range of archetypal figures and then set up their own landscape. And we have it arranged differently here though. I worked on this with Gabriel Martinez and all of these sort of figures are kind of latent in the shadow space, able to be curated and refined up to the top of your platform. Um, but I was thinking of a way of acknowledging, you know, the sacredness of objects and the sacredness of people determining their own space. And also thinking about all this creative human activity that remains in the dark matter with only some of it making its way up. And it turns out that I actually come in every Monday to clean all this and sift through the sand and kind of reset these potential ingredients for people to use to construct their own version. There's um, a grid of 300 nails, and originally there were 300 prints, um, these pop-out templates of the cam that I printed with Gabriel Martinez as well. And I was thinking of it like a visual voting booth. Like people could accept and just take a print home with them. They could reject it and just leave it, or they could reform it 
and if they wanted to, they could sit down at the board table that I provided with the supplies and reform the space that they're in and then put it up, display it inside of that which it amends. And what ended up happening is right away, like two thirds of people did sit down at the board table and did alter the template and did put it up for display and they seemed to be having a really good time with it. So I just kind of mixed that false, um, you know, I just mixed that false scarcity and that run of 300 didn't seem to matter and I'm just providing, you know, more and more of these prints and seeing what accumulates. So, so yes, my show is crowded with proposals, with surplus possibility, but I think that's necessary now in our time. Not just as capitalism turns the corner into oligarchy, not just as we live in a city that's simultaneously the belly of the beast and an unsurveilled incubator of survival creativity. Not just as artists choose whether we make luxury goods and investment commodities or experiments and interventions outside. And not just as many of our support structures have turned into mechanisms of extraction. But exactly here, within one of the remaining institutions, that may still have a privileged cause, where they can still decide whether to be a country club or a civic space, where they can still decide whether to use the sacred sliver that a contemporary art museum may occupy to recreate the same model town in the dominant economy or to try out space. As the late our in place doesn't ask us to be convinced that it does everything well. Moreover, there is always an opposition to say that it does everything very badly, but to be convinced that it's the only thing possible. With the political event, a possibility emerges that escapes the prevailing powers control over possibility. All of a sudden, people, sometimes masses of people, start to think there's another possibility. They gather together to discuss it and they form an organization. They make some immense errors, but that's not the important They make the possibility opened up by the event come alive. I think that that is the way that things happen in all types of creation. And so, up there, in the possible but not usually utilized space, is a 40-foot balloon made by heat sealing, hand ironing, 36 emergency blankets together and it has its own custom engineered breathing system attached to it. And it's an homage to Bartholomew's short story, The Balloon. But it's also an affirmation that just because you don't know exactly what's next doesn't mean there is no next.